The concept of climate change can be really scary to so many in so many different ways, but to gardeners, it elicits a fear deeper than just dreading a longer summer or enjoying a warmer winter. It means our gardens might not perform the way they used to, or worse, not perform at all after all of the effort and love that we put into them because of the potential of getting hit with early frosts and sufferable sun or drought, right? But never fear, today's episode is dedicated to how to kind of climate-proof your garden with a lifelong gardener and climate advocate who is giving us so much insight into what's happening in our garden, when the climate does change, and how to prepare for it. Welcome to the Growing Joy with Plants podcast, where we not only learn how to care for plants successfully, but how to simply and affordably use our plant babies to cultivate more joy in our lives by doing so. I'm Maria, former plant killer turned happy plant lady, author of Growing Joy, The Plant Lover's Guide to Cultivating Happiness, speaker, podcaster, and most importantly, your new best plant friend. On Growing Joy with Plants, you'll find conversations about houseplant care, gardening tutorials, and wellness through the lens of plants. Plant care is self-care on Growing Joy. Hello. Hello, hello, my sweet plant friends. If you're new here, I'm Maria. I'm the host of this podcast and I'm here to help you care for plants successfully and grow more joy in your life by doing so. And if you're a repeat listener, welcome home. Welcome back. Such an honor to be here with you today to help you continue growing successfully. And this episode, which is so interesting to listen to, Kim Stoddart, the guest is so interesting. She was a fast friend at the end of this episode. I was like in love with her. We really just cover so much about how to prepare our gardens this year for a really robust harvest and experience, whether or not you are affected by climate change, right? But climate change is something we're all going to have to think about in the next few decades. So why not start thinking about it now? I hope you loved last week's episode. Since the spring equinox, I've really been feeling into my plants and feeling the spring awakening. And I feel like this week's episode is the perfect next step because now that we've connected to the spring energy, now that we've connected into Earth's energy, we're going to want to support the Earth, right? We're going to want to support Mother Earth and support our gardens by preparing our gardens for whatever may come. So Kim Stoddart, our guest today, is a gardener with a particular interest in climate change and specifically making your gardens resistant to climate change. She has a whole book that has just come out on this topic, and she gifts us an hour of her time diving deep into what's happening with climate change and how it can affect our gardens, and most importantly, how to prepare for it. I'm curious what you think of this episode, if it inspires you, if there's one particular thing that you are going to do after listening to it with your gardens. So let me know. DM me at Growing Joy with Maria on Instagram. Or email me, maria at growingjoywithmaria.com. All right, this is such a juicy episode, so let's dive right in. Welcome, Kim, to Growing Joy. So excited to chat with you today. Oh, thank you so much. It's absolutely brilliant to be here on your show. Yeah, climate change, climate resilient gardening. I mean, it's such an important topic to discuss. It also can feel intimidating, overwhelming, You feel like, how do you even begin sometimes as a hobby gardener to take these steps forward? So I'm excited to mine you for information today. Before we dive into building a climate resistant garden, I would love to hear how you became the amazing gardener kind of climate activist that you are. Thank you very much. It is, as you say, it's a huge topic and there's so much that's happened over the last few years where this has just come to the fore. We've been experiencing the extreme weather on the ground. So For me, it's something that is very, I feel obviously very passionate about it. And I actually used to have a very different career. I used to run businesses in Brighton and um, I used to work with a lot of environmental organisations. So I was really, I suppose, connected with some of the issues that were at play. And then I moved to the beautiful wild west of Wales 14 years ago which is a very remote part of the UK. And it's a bit of a wildlife haven. And I focused on my career on gardening because my love of gardening, I want to turn that into a, a career. So I've been writing for publications like The Guardian ever since then. And I currently edit the Amateur Gardening magazine as well, which is very exciting. And really, I suppose it was my experiences gardening for free for The Guardian Mm -hmm. that really took me on a journey into the frontline impact that climate change was having because my gardens flooded 
So this was back in about oh. 2014. And I had an extreme flooding event um, for, another, I can't think of another way of describing it, um, really, but my gardens flooded. So they were actually underwater for weeks on end. So that was really what started me on the journey of actually looking to other cultures around the world, looking to the past, looking to the future to find out how we can shore up the defences. So I've been writing about it ever since. Wow. Did your garden survive? I'm like, after being underwater, was it just mush? What ended up happening? I think mush is a really good way of describing it, to be honest with you. When plants have been underwater for such a prolonged period of time, there is a real risk of all sorts of different issues, such as contaminants. So the produce can become contaminated. Obviously, it can turn to mush. I love that word. It's very apt description of how it will look. But also the soil becomes damaged. So there are all sorts of you know, basically issues with that. So what I had to do was I had to effectively start again. I had to look at ways of actually building up resilience in that garden. But because I'm a journalist, of course, I see this as material. So for me, it's obviously it's a stressful thing to experience, but I turned it into material for my writing and it's helped inform the things that I do now. So to give you an example of what I did, I built a swale at the back of the garden, which is basically... Okay. I don't know if you're familiar with what that is, but it's a way of putting no. lots of plants. So you put lots of perennial plants at the back okay. of the garden, lots of long grass, and that can provide a first line of defence to actually help soak up the water. So that was oh. the first thing that I did. Uh, you can have a bioswale as well, which is a ditch, effectively, that has plants growing in it. It's okay. just a very fancy way of describing it. But also systems like no-till, also looking at planting in raised beds, lots of different things like that just worked incredibly well. As a way to absorb and hold all of the extra water. Yeah, absolutely. So you're trying okay. to find a way of preventing the water from actually causing so much damage in the first place. And the other thing you can do is you can create channels, you can have drainage channels. You can also create a feature out of an area that's at risk of some form of flooding. So you can create, for example, a dipping pond which actually helps to rain harvest effectively. So it's actually going to hold the water so it's there for you to you know, tip in, uh, sort of dip into in the summer months. So there's ways of turning an area that's at risk of, I wouldn't say extreme flooding, because obviously extreme flooding is something else. But if it's at risk of uh, mild to moderate flooding, there's a way of actually working around to help prevent that happening, but also to make the best use of that space when it's subject to this. So it's very much yeah. about thinking on your feet around the challenge at hand. Yeah, I recently had my friend Kevin come on to talk about homesteading. And he talks, you know, that's such a water retention, capturing water when it rains in order to save it for later. That's such a big part of the homestead conversation. Your book particularly, and I feel like your passion particularly, is about vegetable gardening. Do you feel like there's a tie between climate and food that really motivates you to hone in on specifically vegetable gardening and making vegetable gardening more resilient? Absolutely. I think it's we're feeding ourselves, we're feeding our stomachs, but we're feeding our souls as well. And I think there is from a mindful and logistical and future resilient perspective, growing some of your own food is such an important thing to do. The world's feeling very, very out of control right now. And the joy, the mm -hmm. sheer joy of actually nurturing some produce from a seed, watching as it springs into life, into food that you can then pick and nurture and bring to the table feels absolutely fantastic. You're saving, um, you're saving plastic from buying it from a shop or supermarket, but the flavor and the ability to do that is something that feels incredibly personally empowering. And absolutely fantastic. So even on a windowsill, there's an awful lot of produce that you can grow for pick and come again leaves, for herbs. There's all sorts of exciting possibilities that you can open up your world to. But it's, I mean, during winter, I've turned over loads of my windowsills in the house to growing all sorts of different edibles. I've actually got some here as well. I, Joy can see, Maria can see this, but there's um, lots of indoor growing experiments going on. Oh, I love that. Yeah, I think you spoke to the like emotion, the wellness behind of it. Also the sharing of food that you grow with the people you love. That's an incredible like sharing my homegrown tomatoes or, you know, once I made a 
I had dinner with some girlfriends and I made them a salad with almost everything from my garden. And it just felt like I was offering myself to them in addition of this, you know, of this food offering. And yeah, I think it really empowers you. And I think once you see the life cycle of a, of a tomato or of a lettuce or of food, it really makes you grocery shop different right. because I feel like we're so disconnected from food and also disconnected from the earth that the more we can reconnect, the easier it is going to be for us to actually care about climate change and about, you know, resiliency. Yeah, it all makes so much sense. So you know, talking so fantastic, doesn't it? Sorry, it feels so, so fantastic. And you can name plants. This Mm -hmm. is a thing, there was a survey done recently in the UK, and they found that quite a large percentage of people were naming their house plants. And like you say, it's that connection, isn't it? It just feels so incredibly special to, to be able to, in the case of edibles, eat something that you've nurtured from the seed. It's amazing. Totally. And I think for anyone listening today, you know, we have a collection of houseplant parents, a collection of gardeners who listen to the show. And if you're like climate resilient garden, what the hell are you talking about? I just have houseplants on my window so that I name. I do think houseplants end up being this kind of quote unquote gateway drug for the gardeners. It's like you start with the houseplants, you graduate to your balcony and, you know, you grow a little bit outdoors, then you graduate to a big garden. Then all of a sudden you're composting. Then all of a sudden you're looking at pollinator friendly plants. And then all of a sudden you're homesteading. Like it's just this natural progression that I see so many people go through. So even if this episode doesn't serve you right at this very moment, it's probably going to serve you in the future of your gardening career. So speaking of the gardener, I thought it was interesting when I was reading your book, The Resilient Gardener versus The Resilient Garden. Uh, Can you talk about why you chose to even write about that? I thought it was a very interesting kind of take. So what's what's the difference and why is it important to have resiliency both in yourself as a gardener and in the garden? Thank you. That's a really, really good question. It's The thing is, we are facing such unprecedented challenges with the world as we know it, with the extreme weather that we're experiencing on the ground. And the ability to actually build resilience in yourself is important because it's important to be able to think on your feet around the latest challenge at hand. So say, for example, we have traditionally certain times of year that we will sow seed. So if you look at the back of a seed packet, there's recommended sowing dates, but actually we can have late frost. You know, the very, very, I call it topsy-turvy weather means that actually it's about thinking, what works for me? What works for my own individual growing conditions? What do you think, what what do I think I should do right now? And because we are so used to following instructions, that actually makes us quite vulnerable to the challenges when things aren't as we expect them to be, seasons aren't as we expect them to be. There are new pests, there are new threats moving in with regards to our gardens and plants on the ground and house plants as well. So the ability to actually problem solve comes from comes from within. And It's ability to say, no, I'm not doing it like that because that doesn't make sense in my garden. I think I should do it like this. And that takes quite a while to build initially, Mm. but there's lots of things such as uh, repurposing, repurposing waste items into some wonderful planter for the windowsill. You know, little by little, the way that we can actually be less reliant on following exacting seed instructions buying everything in and actually learning to improvise, share, swap, exchange with others, say, for example, with seed swaps, there's a way of actually building that ability, innate ability within us, which we all have within us, to actually think, I'm going to do it like this. There's all sorts of examples around this, and I, I can just talk, but it's um it's a great thing to do. And it is we are living through such stressful times that the well-being side of things is really, really important. As you know, with the, the work that you do, it's it's really important to also take time out for yourself as well, for the, the process of actually of the nurturing of plants, but not to do, do so in a stressful way. So often gardeners have really long exacting to-do lists and there's so much guilt around oh, I haven't done this or I haven't done that or why does my garden look like this one that I saw on TV? So as much as you can, it's really good to try and step away from that and just Mm -hmm. find a way of gardening that works for you as well to build the confidence to actually do that. Yeah, 100%. So when it comes to building a resilient garden, what are the climate issues that we should be thinking about 
as we set out to build a more resilient garden? What are we facing? What are we looking at in the next 10 years, now and in the next 10 years? So this sort of doom and gloom bit. If you've listened to the podcast or followed me on socials, you know that my Wind River wind chimes have been the underscoring to my life for the last couple of years. I love that they are constant reminders to drop into the present moment whenever their chimes drift through my home, through my windows, and they've basically turned my home into a spa. I am so excited to announce the new Wind River Eclipse collection of chimes, launching in conjunction with the Great North American Eclipse occurring on April 8th, 2024. This ad is actually being underscored by new original music using the Eclipse Collection chimes by the Shane Flying Sun Tapes, which you can find on any major music streaming service. Unlike any other Wind River chimes ever made, this limited edition collection of uniquely tuned Corinthian bells are tuned to the Lydian mode, a unique scale which creates an ethereal atmosphere of enchantment that matches the mystery and wonder of the solar eclipse and of outer space. The Eclipse Collection is available in three sizes. The 30 inch, which sounds like this. The 50 inch, which sounds like this. And the epic 78 incher. If you're hearing this ad before the eclipse on April 8th, you can make these wind chimes the soundtrack of your eclipse if you order by March 29th. And if you're hearing this ad after April 8th, get yourself a chime from the Eclipse Collection or any other collection on windriverchimes.com to add some mystery, enchantment, and beauty to your home and garden. As always, code GROWINGJOY at windriverchimes.com will get you a free engraving on any engravable wind chime. All wind chimes make amazing gifts or a special gift to yourself. They come in a variety of colors, sizes, and sounds. So head to windriverchimes.com to listen and learn, and don't forget to use the code GROWINGJOY at checkout. As we talk about this idea of a climate change resistant vegetable garden, I think one of the biggest things is ensuring that our plants have a really beautifully biodiverse, healthy, rich soil and compost that we're planting in, right? And so when we're talking about that, I have to tell you about Espoma Organic, the company whose soil and compost I've been using for a long time that has a ton of amazing sustainability commitments as a company and also with their products. So if you don't already know, Espoma Organic is a 90-year-old family-owned and operated company dedicated to making safe indoor and outdoor gardening products for people, pets, and the planet. Before we even dive into their products, they have a huge sustainability commitment. They have a 100% solar-powered plant, zero-waste manufacturing, and eco-friendly packaging, right? So when we talk about you know, making the right choices for the earth and environment, those choices are easily reflected in Espoma's mission. And as you prep your garden this season, Espoma has high quality organic options for indoor and outdoor plant collections. So you can start your seeds in their seed starter mix and then plant those seedlings in your garden with their Biotone Starter Plus plant food that helps your plants grow larger root masses to help them establish faster and also reduces transplant loss. They have a garden soil for whatever type of garden you have, whether it's in ground, raised bed, containers, and their composts are amazing. They have a land and sea one and then a mushroom one. And then you continue feeding your plants throughout the summer with their line of tones, which are their organic fertilizers. They have tones specifically formulated for whatever you're growing. So they have a tomato tone, a citrus tone, a rose tone, a flower tone, a bulb tone, a garden tone. (laughs) They have a tone for everything. So you should check them out. To learn more about the indoor and outdoor products that Espoma has and see where your local Espoma dealers are, you can go to espoma.com to check out their products and find your local dealer. Or you can click the link in the show notes to go to my curated Espoma favorites section of my Amazon storefront. Thanks, Espoma. Yeah, the doom and gloom. Let's let's get it over with before we get into the problem solving side of it. Perfect. Yes, we'll we'll go on to the solutions. But the main doom and gloom areas are the fact that it's so unpredictable. The weather is so unpredictable. We do not know what we're going to get, and the extremes are everything from flooding to wildfires to storms to strong winds to again the unseasonality sometimes of the weather on the ground. So 
nature is confused, plants are confused, gardeners are confused. So it's learning to actually to work around that. But the other challenges are a greater risk of pests and disease, unfortunately. And this is because if we have, say, for example, a milder winter, then you can get this ability for more pests to overwinter potentially. There's more potential uh, breeding opportunities for them and so on and so forth. And we're also seeing with the changing climates around the world, there's also invasive species that are moving in as well, which have potential to cause a lot of challenges. Also, we have the risk of things like soil erosion, particularly mm -hmm. if there's an excess of rain, particularly at certain times of year as well, soil can be damaged. So some plants won't fare as well in the future. Some varieties will be challenged. Some things are going to become harder to grow. But there are opportunities around this. There are opportunities within this. It just means it's no longer gardening as usual. So it's about keeping up to date with different ways of doing things. Yeah, I mean, it's never more heartbreaking than you have a beautiful garden that gets taken out by some sort of invasive pest or totally fry. When you talk about soil erosion and flooding, is it that your garden gets flooded and then the water leaches the nutrients out of the soil and then leaves it kind of messed up after the water recedes? Yeah, that's exactly it. Um, if, yeah. you, if you dig over your soil, then mm -hmm. you are also, you are reducing uh, the ability for natural systems to help and natural systems can help in a no-till garden environment because soil structure if you imagine to explain that as well if you imagine soil and you imagine plants growing in the soil the roots of the plants have the ability to help hold the soil together so it provides it with structure and there is an amazing world a hugely biodiverse world the world wide web below the soil that we are just mm -hmm. really at the tip of the iceberg of proverbial iceberg of learning about that can actually come to the aid of plants. The mm -hmm. likes of my heroes of fungi can actually help bind itself to plant roots and help them find food and water. So there's a much greater ability for that soil, well composted mulch soil that has uh, been, where well, there's been a no-till system employed that has plants growing on it, trying to avoid bare soil using things like green manures over winter it can cope with a greater excess of water. And as you mentioned earlier, it means there's less likelihood of nutrients, unfortunately, being leached away, which is a real threat at the moment. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Where do we begin? So you mentioned the soil and how resiliency really starts in the soil. So as a gardener, knowing everything that you just shared, how can I make my soil more resilient. Obviously, planting plants is part of that, right? Because the roots provide structure that hold the soil in place so that it can't get washed away. Is there anything else? Are there amendments I should be adding into my soil? What are other techniques that I can use to protect it? There's quite a few things. The the no the no till can be done. That you can start that with a bare, bare okay. Wait, ground. let me ask you. So, because no till I hear a lot. So, can you define what no till yes. gardening means? Yes. No. Thank you. Good question. You sometimes assume that. Yeah. It's because it's a term that's bandied around. It's basically involves not disturbing the soil. So not digging over the soil, not turning over the soil. Ultimately, though, if you can do that less, that's also very positive as well. So I wouldn't say that I'm completely and utterly 100% no-till because there are times when I will turn over the soil if it needs to be turned over. But by reducing the amount that you do that, the more you can allow these natural systems to build below ground. So if you imagine, for example, the earthworm, and this is just one example, there's, let's say there's so many creatures below ground that provide a beneficial service to the soil and the health and vitality and also the structure of the soil. But for example, the earthworm's going to be building channels, it's going to be fertilising the ground. So there's so many benefits to actually leaving this intact to actually help these natural systems work to create healthier soil that can help, then help to feed your plants. So a lot of the time, there's this idea that we have to heavily water and feed our plants. With house plants, it's obviously different. But in the ground, if you can get the soil the best it can possibly be, tapping into these all these different natural abilities, then you don't necessarily need to actually feed anything to your soil. And actually, in fact, if you take a plant that's just been, say, a seedling that's just been planted out, if you feed it and water it too much, 
it won't actually expand its roots further into the soil to try and connect with these natural systems like the mycorrhizal fungi that are actually there that can come to its aid. So by watering and feeding less in the soil, you can in fact create more resilient plants as well, which is really quite fascinating and brilliant. So it means less work in turn for the gardener. So less toing and froing with watering and feeding mm-hmm. with expensive fertilizers and supplements that you feel you have to get in. And what helps the soil have that water retention? Is it having the amazing kind of biome that it has underground? Is it the what's made up of the soil that you're putting into it? Like, is it amending it or it's just making sure that it's naturally healthy? I mean, there's different things you can add. Compost is the obvious one. That's the traditional thing that we think we need to add. But to buy in compost can be expensive. You can make your own, but it's going to take a while for that to break down. Mm -hmm. So it's quite difficult to make all of your own compost. So mulching is amazing. Magic mulching, I call it. So it involves using often a lot of materials that you would find naturally for free in your area. So if you're mowing your lawn, grass clippings can be used as a mulch. And you only want to use a very thin layer but you can use them in pots as well. So if you have container plants, you can use them as a very thin mulch on the ground as well. And it will help to keep water in the soil during the summer months, for example. Also things like wood chip as well. There's a friend of mine, um, Ben Raskin's written a whole book just on using wood chip as well, which gives you an idea of how many different uses there are for this material. Leaf mold, again, these are all materials that are freely available that you can make yourself and can be used to actually help improve the soil. There's all sorts of different opportunities. Um, In different areas, you can use potentially straw as well. And in fact, the lady that really first started the no-till movement was from America, uh, it's Ruth Doubt as well. So that was the idea of no work gardening. And she started experimenting with straw basically. So using straw to actually help to build these soil systems and to build resilience naturally. So there's all sorts of different things you can do around where you live, materials you have to hand, and what also your personal style is as well, and ways that you like to work. Wow, that's a lot of options that I love. Yeah, I feel like there's that classic, like get a bag of leaves and then mow it, like put your mower over it and then use that to kind of scatter everywhere. Absolutely. There's also chop and drop, as it's called, Mm -hmm. which is a term that's used in permaculture circles. And basically what that means is that if you imagine a a veg patch on, if we imagine a nice warm summer's day, which is quite nice actually to imagine at the moment. So if you imagine you've got loads of very hungry plants, say like tomatoes growing in the ground, if you have, if you're pulling off leaves, so you're just pulling off some of the side shoots or there's maybe something growing nearby that's been slightly nibbled, you can actually just chop and drop. You can just put them on the ground to create an instant mulch, which is protecting the ground from the sun, preventing it from drying out and can actually break down to feed to the nutrients and the life that's in the soil. So it depends how wild you want to grow. Some people just will almost compost on the ground. There's also things like hugel culture beds, which is a system that's been used widely in the in Europe, Eastern Europe, where they will actually take a load of woody, uh, say, either if you've chopped down some trees, trunks from trees, or it could just be sticks, and you can create a bed. It's actually called the ultimate in a low-maintenance permaculture bed because you build up a layer of straw of, say, for example, wood chip and compost, and you can just plant straight into that. So there's all different, different exciting things you can do. But it's also, it depends on how you want your garden to look. So for some people, some of these things can be a little bit too wild, in -hmm. which case I suggest just weaving in some wilder areas and just creating a bit of a feature about it. And the more you do it, the more you can get a feel for what works for you and what you think you can get away with. If you want to, you can get extremely wild. Yeah. I mean, that's half the fun, right? And you said you raised, you raised bed gardening as well can be very kind of sustainable and resilient. So how does that play in? Because I know we have a lot of listeners who either do grow bag gardening or raised bed gardening. Yeah, with my own gardens, in my own personal experience, because I've got climate change training gardens in the, the wild west of Wales. So I used raised beds, which are made out of recycled wood, 
So I used wood that I got off um, local builders. So there's mm-hmm. some from, again, they were used for housing projects. And uh, so it's leftover wood, basically. I've got a couple of old tract tires as well, which I use for growing comfrey in. So for me, though, the reason I had raised beds is that because there's a risk of flooding, it helps to lift the plant roots up out of the, the threat of the flooding. And I also use gravel, like an aggregate, as well as a porous pathway. So that means Mm. water can actually sink down and through and away so that it means I can use the pathways all year round and get to the raised beds. And that's actually another thing with flooding is this idea of slow it, sink it, spread it as well, because you need to try and slow the flow if there's a risk of flooding. So water, water will find the quickest way, water will find the way. So if you can get it to sink in the ground, if you can collect it, if you can channel it away to slow it down and then to sink it, that's a way of actually coping with the threat of, yeah, of say, okay, wait. your area. Say that again, slow it, sink it, spread it. It's actually slow it, spread it, sink it. I think I said it the wrong way around. Okay. So slow it, slow down the way the water is hitting your garden yes. and running through it. Spread it. How are you spreading it? You, you can spread it by having a swale. Or you can have what's called a rail or a French drain, which basically means you can have an ornamental channel with a bit Mm -hmm. of gravel in it that actually helps to channel the water away. And you can create a bit of a feature in your garden. It can look rather beautiful, actually. And then you could head that down to, say, for example, an area in your garden where you want to collect rainwater. Like the pond or something. Yeah, like a pond, a dipping pond, or just a pond, a wildlife pond. And Mm -hmm. so it's a way of actually spreading it out. So it's taking this this sheer force of water and just just reducing that flow in various different ways. And then the last one is sink it, which is sink it into the ground or into a pond. Absolutely, sink it away. I mean, obviously, when the ground is really saturated, it's not going to go down. And actually, if you um, a nice analogy of the importance of rainwater harvesting, if you can do it, is that if you imagine a row of houses all together, and if every house, if there's a risk of flood, if every house in that road were to even put something like an old bin outside to actually collect the rainwater, it will massively slow the flow. So it's water will collect. And you can have scenarios where, for example, somebody's built a new shed or they've built a new structure, and it can compromise the the natural flow of the water and create these issues. So it will build up, like the idea of having a a concrete, concrete areas don't allow the water to flow away. So where possible, it's good to have uh, porous materials. So things like gravel, things like grass, and then there's more likelihood of the water actually sinking into the ground. So if I wanna put a fire pit in my backyard, it's more resilient for me to put a gravel fire pit than to pour concrete in my backyard and put my fire pit on top of it. Gravel would be the more resilient option. It is. I mean, you could always create a feature out of it and you could always do, if you really, really wanted to have concrete, Mm -hmm. then you could always put some gravel around the outside. So you could create Mm -hmm. a little concrete gravel fire pit. So it's important to do it in a way that, that works. Mm -hmm. So there's there's different options. A lot of the time, there's also this approach that, no, you can't, you mustn't do this. Um, No, 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 that's wrong. But I think it's actually good to try and find middle ground. If you really want to do something, then try and find a way of of doing that if it's really important to you. Yeah. And I think as we have multiple conversations on this podcast about sustainability, about homesteading, about like kind of taking that next step in your garden, you can't do everything at once. It's about choosing one thing and doing, you know, taking your first step towards that and like slowly increasing. It's not like you have to completely overhaul your garden because you listen to this episode or read a book. And you know what I mean? So you mentioned water. I think water security is on everyone's mind. So are there any other things about rainwater harvesting that we should know what are your favorite ways to build resiliency when it comes to water besides all of the things that, is there anything else? Frankly, you've already gone through a lot of the different options, but are we missing anything in the water conversation? 
There are all sorts of different containers of all different sizes, makes, colors, models that you can have that can be weaved into the smallest space. So there's lots of different options out there, but you can also do some quite fun things with recycled materials, things that are repurposed. So if, if you feel the inclination, even something like a freestanding bath, for example, or a, a sink could be used to actually create a makeshift water collector that would be beneficial for wildlife because as well as feeding wildlife, say, for example, birds over winter, which will then help with natural pest control, they also need a source of water. So depending on what you feel comfortable with, you can get quite creative and it's quite fun. It is actually really fun to look at something that would otherwise go to landfill and just to think, what can I turn that into? That's mm -hmm. a way of taking control back with climate change upcycled mm. item by upcycled item and it's it's great there's there's all sorts of things you can do and it's i think actually from an empowering perspective i think that has to be one of the best things you can do as well because it really builds confidence that could be a pretty epic vignette is to have this like old clawfoot bathtub in your backyard <laughs> surrounded by beautiful plants yeah and i love the idea of that upcycle like what can i upcycle beyond the water can i upcycle this Hot? Can I upcycle the, the old bathtub that we're throwing out? I just think that's so fun and a different kind of lens to look at it. In upcycling, any other ways that you would recommend people to recycle or upcycle in their garden beyond water capturing? I think try and make use of every material that you can. That's absolutely key. There's a lot of waste. I mean, even simple things like if you just look at tools, so often there's so many shiny new tools that we see each year we mm -hmm. can get tempted into buying. But there's so much more benefit to looking after, repairing, oiling, sharpening the tools that you already have. And then you have mm. that long-term connection with them. You can even name them. I'm not <laughs> saying I have, mm -hmm. but it, again, it's, it, feels, it feels really, really meaningful to do that. And to have higher quality tools in the first place that you can just look after, it's really, really easy to, for example just clean and sharpen a pair of secateurs and that feels really good to do but also there's this idea that so for example with garden waste that we get we have to get rid of it actually there's so much you can do with garden waste so with prunings from trees creating a log pile using something if you can get a chipper maybe to actually add some of these materials more materials to the compost heap if mm -hmm. you have any woolen clothes you can compost them which feels mm. great. There's lots of things you can actually use to add to the compost heap or you can use around the garden. If you live rurally as well, something like sheep wool is great as a material for soil improvement or to use around pots. So depending on where you live and what materials are freely available, for example, coffee. If there's a coffee shop, then you can use coffee grinds in really exciting ways. You can grow oyster mushrooms on them. They make a fantastic soil improver. You can add them to the compost. So one person's waste material can be another person's soil improver, which is rather brilliant. I love that. Yeah, we did a mini series on mushrooms on the podcast in 2023, learning how to grow them indoors and outdoors. And I have visions of my, I rent, I have a grow bag garden. I don't grow in ground yet, but um, I have visions of inoculating like tree stumps, like having a little stump mushroom garden. Cause also mushrooms are so nutritious. Like they're so great Absolutely. for your compost and your plants, but they're so great for your human body as well. In the conversation of upcycling and recycling, I also think like the ultimate recycling is capturing your seeds and using them again, right? So Absolutely. you have this interesting chapter in your book on seed sovereignty, and you don't have to do anything different in your garden. You don't have to install one log bed. You don't have to do any water retention. You can just start saving your own seeds. And that's one step towards a more sovereign, secure garden in your future. So why is this important? And where would you suggest people begin? Oh, it's amazing. It is absolutely fantastic. I'm so glad you asked me. Thank you. 
It is one of the best things you can do. And there are so, so many reasons why. When I first started doing this, it was when I was writing for The the Guardian. And I I went Mm -hmm. on this quest to see if I could garden entirely for free, which was quite ballsy. And I didn't know it was going to be possible to do it, but I like a challenge. So it was really interesting. So when I first started speaking to people about seed saving, this is produce in the garden. And there's lots of things you can, people think that you can easily save seed from like lettuce and pea and rocket, for example. But when you think of other crops, there's a lot of head shaking. There's a lot of sharp intakes of breath and head shaking from people on this topic. Thankfully, now people are are really wise to this and they know that actually there's a huge amount of benefits to be had from doing that. And actually, even the more complicated crops can actually feasibly be home seed saved from if you know what you're doing. But from a climate change perspective, A, you are allowing the crop to often complete its natural cycle, which will help to encourage wildlife into your garden so it's great for boosting biodiversity in your garden it's the natural cycle of the plant so there's loads of benefit there but also you are saving seed that has become more adapted to your own individual growing conditions so why would you not want to do that so if you also plant breed as well by looking at say for example if there's a pea you've been growing which has had its um say for example fared well against drought save seed from that. So if you've had lettuce growing and the other lettuce that you've been growing has been eaten by slugs, but this particular lettuce variety has shown good drought resilience, seem to be able to shake off a nibble or two by slugs, save seed from that. So you can actually save seed from the plants that have shown resilient traits that have appeared to be stronger. And then you are carrying forth those traits for the future. And the great thing with this as well is you can do swaps with friends. So Mm -hmm. it's knowing what people grow, what works really well in your particular area is brilliant because they are more inclined to be crops that you would like to grow. And you can swap and exchange with friends, which is such a meaningful thing to do. Some of the most exciting crops that I grow don't have traditional variety names. They're named after the personal place that I got them from. Mm -hmm. So I've got, for example, Jimmy's Chilies. So I've no idea what variety of chili that is because it's a hybrid. It's mm-hmm. just cha- it's probably changed a few times, but it works. It grows incredibly well. It's really resilient and I love it. So there's all sorts of exciting things you can do with seed as well that gives it, it gives you more of a connection with the plants that you're growing, with the food as well, because you can have a, there's a history and a sense of place to it more than anything. Oh, I love that. That is so beautiful. And I'm the first person to encourage people to plug into their local garden society or there's no better educator, especially if you move, there is no better educator than the people who work at your local garden center or your neighbors to tell you what works, what doesn't, what is the local pest pressure? Like when I moved to where I live, deer, you can't garden outside without a fence. Like it's just, you can't, the deer are going to eat everything. And I wouldn't have known that if my neighbor's hadn't said that, right? So I think that's really important and really beautiful. My husband's hometown at his local library, they have a seed trading station. It's like an old library, you know, where they used to keep the index cards, which people can come and give their seeds, and then they can check out other seeds. And it's the sweetest thing. But if you think about it, you know, in this little town in Cape Cod, they're all seeds that people are harvesting from their plants, just like you said, that are going to be resilient and have proven to grow well there. And I just think it's the sweetest thing I've ever seen whenever I walk by that seed library checkout station. There's hope, isn't there, for the future, I think, yeah. in things like that, in community action, in community offerings, in the personal, the personal connection with something like that. It's A, going to be more effective often mm-hmm. than seed that you can buy that, You don't know if it's going to fare so well in your area, but it's social as well. And you feel, I think with, you know, with climate change, it can feel so incredibly overwhelming. It can Mm. feel all too much. But actually by having that contact with people that doing things like that, and by working together, having a bit of a chat, bit of a laugh and getting some seed, it's again, you feel connected. You feel like together we can do this with Mm -hmm. the natural world, with 
local community action like that with, you know, with the potential to solve some of these problems for the future. Yeah, that's so beautiful. One other thing I wanted to ask you, you mentioned slugs. Pest pressure, obviously, with climate change is becoming a huge issue. Is there anything you can do for your garden specifically to make it more resilient to pests? Because I think if you have an answer to this question, everyone is going to want to hear it. (laughs) There's lots of things that you can do from the, I suppose, the first entry level thing you can do is try and create some sort of attractive habitat for some of the brilliant wildlife predators that can actually lend a helping hand with with pests. So that's the first thing you can do. So say, for example, it could be if you have the room, you could create a makeshift pond is an obvious one to you know attract the likes of uh, frogs, for example, mm. and toes. Um, but you can also, by creating some kind of wild area, even in the back, out of the way, nobody can see it if you don't want them to, but it's there. And if you allow some weeds to grow, such as nettles, and you can weave that in with lots of ground cover, maybe some stones, a log pile, then you can look at attracting creatures like ladybugs, which mm. are the most amazing, amazing predators of, say, green fly. They can mm-hmm. hoover up thousands of, uh, of aphids, for example, during the course of their, uh, their sort of uh, premature stage. So I don't know if you've ever seen uh, ladybird larvae. It's quite fascinating to look at. It doesn't look like a ladybird at all, but they are amazing predators. So trying to encourage in these creatures can help to create a greater balance. Mm. And then your your dastardly slug becomes food for something else. It actually serves a purpose as food for something else, like a bird that can just pick it off and eat it. That won't happen overnight, but you'll be amazed at how quickly you can attract wildlife in. Also, one of the things that I strongly, strongly advocate, which I call free planting, is also known as polyculture. Polyculture, as it's known in permaculture circles, is basically about mixed planting. So if you imagine a vegetable garden, quite often we're familiar with these ideas of block planting. So you'd have a load of cabbages together, you do crop Mm -hmm. rotation, a load of carrots together. But actually by planting in that way, you are making it much, much easier for whatever it is that particularly covers that crop to find what it's looking for. So say in the case of carrots, it's the carrot fly as one example. So that can smell out the carrots from a mile away. So if you imagine the idea of companion planting that you put your, say, your onions and your marigolds in and around the carrots, the thing with polyculture or free planting is that you're doing this on a much bigger, more free-spirited scale. As long as you allow sufficient space, say about seven foot, roughly, between plants of the same family, like tomatoes, you're making it much harder for the likes of blight to actually spread from plant to plant. And for, in the case of cabbages, like brassicas, for the cabbage white butterfly to find what it's looking for. So it's a bit forest gardening. There's a bit Mm -hmm. of forest gardening also thrown in there. You've got different layers. You've got different plants all mixed in together. But it's much harder for pests to find what they're looking for. Mm -hmm. So it is rather, rather brilliant. And it's fun as well. I don't know about you, but I I had, I spent years with my very exacting books of crop rotation systems. So Mm. it used to make my head whirl that on my homestead, which is 2.3 acres, I had to think what I planted in that spot the year before. And then I'd taken something out and then there's something else. And it became really quite stressful. And it's purely through, through experimentation that I thought I'd try planting in this way. Because you're not draining the soil of nutrients at all. And you're not allowing for pest buildup because you're having lots of different plants all mixed in together. It's a bit bit strange to do to begin with. And it takes a bit of a leap of confidence, a leap of faith almost, to think I'm going to free plant. But if you start in a small area to begin with, you can get really creative and then you can actually carry that forth to the rest of your plot. But it massively, massively helps with natural pest control as well. Yeah, we have two for listeners who want to learn more about this particular, we have a whole episode on companion planting, which you can scroll down the feed. 
learn more about that technique. And then also, I just wanted to shout out an episode we did a, a while back in 2021 with Brie from Brie the Plant Lady, but she talks about pest prevention in the garden and planting garlic around your garden, not for insects, but there are a lot of mammal pests that don't like garlic. And you can make this like little wall of protection around your garden because the bunnies aren't going to come and eat the garlic. So I just think that's so fascinating as a natural way to kind of deter pest pressure and without having to kill or hurt anyone. It's like just avoiding steer clear. And it looks prettier, I think. I think this polyculture, this like more wild interplanted companion planting looks much prettier than just like a plot of cabbage, a plot of carrots, a plot, you know, that's like not Absolutely. as aesthetically pleasing. Yeah. And what, um, what I've found actually as well, just to mention another thing on that, is that with people that come on the courses that I do, if they have allotments, they said mm. to me, the great thing about mixed planting in this way is if something goes wrong, people don't notice mm. as well because it's hidden because you've got so mm. many other plants growing there. You mentioned your homestead. So what does your homestead look like? What is your current gardening practice? It's, I've got my climate change training garden. So I have a, it's about a third of an acre garden. There's two polytunnels and I have a vegetable bed there. There's the swale that I mentioned at the back. I have an area where I keep chickens. Then I've got a forest garden as well. So I've got a forest mm -hmm. garden in one of the fields with lots of soft fruits, but also fruit trees. Because I was told when I first moved here 14 years ago that oh, you can't grow fruit trees there. It's too exposed. It's too high up. You definitely won't be able to do it. So that immediately made me want to problem solve and find a way of doing it. Are you growing these trees under a covering or how have you figured that out? Well, I did some research and I found that if I grew very fast growing, they're quite spreading damson trees down the it's the westerly side that would then within a couple of years create a natural protection it's a layer to actually slow the flow of the wind to afford protection wow. for the the fruit trees to grow so it's really productive i mean that field's quite wet so i also allow a few rushes to grow in between the actual plants and the trees because then it also helps to soak up the the water so it's a bit wild so there's sort of long mm. grass in there, but no, it works fantastically. It works extremely well and it's very satisfying. And I've used the layer effect quite a lot in my garden. So if you're in an exposed spot, then mm. slowing the flow by having things like natural hedging or lots of different plants and trees can actually really help to make a difference. It can also improve temperature as well. To overall. break the wind and create like a little microclimate. Absolutely. And it means yeah. more edibles. It means more edibles as well. So yeah, benefits. man, we're at time already. And we have totally barely scratched the surface of your insane wisdom on this topic. I hope that maybe you can come back on in the future. We didn't even talk about building coverage coverages and greenhouse, but your book also goes through all of this. So where can everyone find you on socials and where can people find your book and your courses if they want to learn more from you? Thank you. I would love to come back on. It would be an absolute pleasure. There's information about me on greenrocketcourses.com mm -hmm. and on social media, I'm on Instagram, Kim underscore Stoddart, and I'm on X at, at Badly Behaved One and yeah. also on Facebook. <laughs> the idea being with the um, the X handle is that it's, it's well behaved, but it's just uh, mm -hmm. quite like the idea of that. I also edit the Amateur Gardening magazine as well. So I'm the editor of that. So I'm, I'm in that every issue. That's a fortnightly magazine. What is the name of your book and where can everyone find it? Thank you. It's the Climate Change Resilient Vegetable Garden, which is published by Cool Springs Press. So it's available everywhere, hopefully. Yeah, wherever um, books are sold. So, yeah, absolutely. So it's widely available and it's already been translated into Spanish, actually. Oh, Italian. Sorry, Italian. Um, I love that. I know. And the, I've also <laughs> written, I've co-authored another book called The Climate Change Garden with Sally Morgan. So that's also available now. That came out last year and that's published by Cool Springs Press. So that looks more at gardening per se, whereas the new book is mm. about more of the make, mend and do. It's more about the well-being side and it's focused on vegetable growing as well. 
Yeah. I mean, at the, we didn't even get into this, but at the end, you have all of the vegetables you should be growing in your garden if you want it to be resilient. So we'll link to all of that in the show notes. This was so amazing. I'm excited to read your book. I love how, well, I read your book, but I'm excited to have it on my bookshelf to refer back to as my garden continues to grow because gardening is a lifelong hobby and caring for the planet is a lifelong hobby. So Kim, you're amazing. Thanks so much for being with us today. Thank you so much. It's absolutely brilliant. Thank you for inviting me on your brilliant podcast. Thank you, Kim. This episode was so awesome. She's so awesome. I kind of fell in love with her during this interview. She's so knowledgeable. She's so passionate. Her book, The Climate Change Resilient Vegetable Garden is out now. You should totally grab it, whether through your local bookshop, amazonbookshop.org. It's available wherever books are sold. And once again, it's called The Climate Change Resilient Vegetable Garden by Kim Stoddart. And all of her links to the book and also to her socials are in the show notes. So you should check it out. It's a heavy subject, plant friends, but it's important. And also as gardeners, we are taking care of our lands and hopefully making a positive impact on the world. So I hope this episode was inspiring. Let me know if you end up doing any of these techniques that we discussed in your gardens this year. And until next week, I hope you keep growing joy. Plant friend, thank you for tuning in today. It means so much to me that I get to be part of your planty journey. If you like what you heard, make sure you're subscribed to the show so you never miss an episode. We have so many incredible interviews and solo episodes on incredible houseplant and gardening topics that you will not want to miss this year. And while you're over there in the podcast player subscribing, why don't you click over to the review section of Growing Joy with Plants and leave us a review. Reviews are tremendously helpful for the growth of the podcast, so thanks in advance. If you're looking for more opportunities to grow as a plant parent with Growing Joy content, we've got so many options for you. First, I highly recommend you taking the Plant Parent Personality Test. It's free. It's super fun. It takes three minutes to complete. At the end of the test, you're going to get your Plant Parent Personality Profile and a curated list of plants, projects, and podcast episodes that are right up your alley, tailored just for you and your lifestyle, inspired by your results. The links are in the show notes. If you're looking to uplevel your plant parent game, I have so many free downloads on my website that I think could help you, like the Understanding Natural Light download or nine different ways to green up your office space. If you'd like to support the show monetarily and help me bring the show to as many people as possible for free, you can head to our Patreon link in the show notes to learn more about our offerings. And finally, I invite you to come hang out with me and continue the planty conversation on social media, on Instagram and TikTok. I'm growing joy with Maria. My DMs are always open if you have requests for topics or ideas for the show. Thank you again for listening. It is truly my honor and delight to help you keep blooming and keep growing joy.